Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth, your fast paced half hour, 45 minutes that are, that's designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. We always begin the show with a, a special guest and today our special guest is John Burton and we'll get to him in a second. Uh, before we get to that though, I want to remind everybody that if you want to visit our website at zelllaw.com, you can hear prior uh, video casts and also podcasts. And also, if you want to look us up on Apple Podcasts, just search for Blueprint for Wealth and you'll be able to listen to all the prior broadcasts that we've been doing. And then after today's podcast, stay tuned for our educational moment that features a special topic that you may find of interest that's linked to John's background. So stay tuned for that special moment. Today, again, I'm welcoming John Burton, who is a well-known venture capitalist and board advisor and technologist. Welcome, John. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. A little bit about John's background. He's had a, an incredibly diverse career. I've known him for many years, and he's been involved in the technology and software industry mostly, but he's founded uh, software firms that are high growth. He's He ran a venture capital firm for many years that funded a lot of those outfits. He co-founded co co Update Adventures, which was uh, uh, years and years ago, but uh, it's, it's something that is well known, at least in the Washington, D.C. metro area, very well for its funding and growth of software companies. And he's an expert in strategy and positioning, which helps complement strong organic growth with advice from experience in the past in doing this. He's done over 30 M&A and IPO events. And again, strategically driven growth, uh, innovative technology and great teams help GTM go to market models that really can be propelled with you know, John's expertise. He currently is running Burton T Tech Partners, which helps advise uh, clients, both in terms of board work, as well as uh, strategy. And uh, he's chairman of the board of a company called Jagger. Uh, it's the world's largest independent SaaS software as a service spend management company. And it connects a network of 4 million suppliers in 70 countries. He's also chairman of the board of a company called C Data Software, has thousands of customers and numerous OEM partners. It's a rapidly growing leader in data access and connectivity solutions. And he's also was a board member most recently of a company called Netrix Corporation. He was uh, involved with Payscale and, uh, as I mentioned, Nintex Global. Uh, John, first, a little bit about your background. I'm really interested in how did you get involved in venture capital and how did you get involved in the software and technology industry originally? Well, those are interesting and happenstance, to be honest with you. I'd love to say that I was a great planner and plan to do this from undergrad. But when I got out of undergrad, technology and software was really just beginning. It so happened I was in Boston and a lot of the jobs that I interviewed for or talked about just getting out of an undergrad and before were in technology. And other than a couple of computer classes, I honestly didn't know much about it. After all these years, I look back and based on your description, it kind of sounds like I can't hold a job. Um, <laughs> Uh, but at the end of the day, I just love the diversity and the fast and dynamic change of tech. So that's really got, what got me started. And that's really what keeps my interest, to be honest with you. Great people, a lot of things happening and frankly, hard to keep up. So the effort is, is fun and worth it. Software as a service is, is a very hot area. Um, it has been for 20, 25 years. I mean, it's really evolved over the last 20 years. Tell us what's going on in SaaS today. What's what's hot and what's not? Well, SaaS, to some large extent, is an economic model and a different way of delivering software that you would otherwise install on your own computers. Right. So in a lot of ways, it made it a lot easier to receive the software or use it because all you needed in the early days was a web browser. But secondarily, for the people who build that software, it allows them to operate on one instance of the software rather than supporting hundreds or thousands of customers, each of whom have their own computer installation. And therefore, the complexity of managing that is tough. The great part about that, honestly, is you get two really good things. One is you get a very fast pace 
of delivery of new capabilities. So that's why Salesforce has done so well and really the pioneer. The second thing is the reason why it is so exciting to investors and the stock market is it's a very cost-effective way to deliver your software. Margins in the SaaS business compared to the traditional on-premise software business are much, much bigger. And it, it's it's a challenge to stay up to others that are competing, but it's it's a terrific way to build great margins and also pour those margins back into ongoing evolution and competitive advantage. So you're really able to cut down on hardware costs today because it's all being done through the cloud, essentially, right? Uh, without a doubt. And if you look at the evolution of clouds, there were dedicated co-location areas, uh, then became the versioning of the public clouds, AWS and Azure. Um, and the statistics and the data centers, particularly in the Virginia area you see going up, are all as a result of the increased demand for clouds. It was five years ago I heard the statistic that every second and a half, a new server goes into a data center. Wow. And that has been increased in terms of velocity. But it is a great way to consolidate things, save, particularly these days, having to hire as many people who are so hard to get to, to evolve your own data center. So it, it's a great way and it shares better economics for the user and the vendor, frankly. And development is also easier, more easily done, isn't it? Because you can do it in the back room. You don't have to drop software on somebody's server, test it, et cetera, et cetera. You can do it all behind the scenes and then roll it out as, as, it, as it becomes available. Without a doubt. And it's actually given rise to a whole new area of delivering that software called DevOps or development and operations. And it also allows anybody in the world to work on a single instance of a package or a program or a SaaS institute. Most software companies these days that have evolved at least to a reasonable size of revenue are using some type of offshore development and deliver in their services in 100, 200 countries. So the idea of legacy systems, particularly those that are being used in the federal government and those that are being used by large institutions are becoming outdated and outmoded, aren't they? Uh, one would think, <laughs> but what, what I would say is that a lot of legacy systems are gonna live a very long time. There's so many COBOL based programs still out there running on a mainframe computer somewhere. They're almost never going to go away because the demand for new apps always really stays ahead of the demand for upgrading old apps. Did I hear you say COBOL? COBOL, yes, indeed. I, I, I learned some rudimentary aspects of COBOL in 1976, <laughs> 75. Um, wow, that, <laughs> we're dating uh, ourselves. <laughs> well, I learned COBOL and IBM Assembler back in roughly the same time frame, and I was so bad at it, I decided computers are great and the technology is terrific and I can make a really good living at it, but I should be selling and, and building companies, not building the technology itself. So one of the companies that you were involved with for several years and you had a great success with was Nintex out of Seattle. Can you tell us a little bit about them and what you did while you were there and how they grew as fast as they did? Nintex is a pretty good example of what venture firms do to find really good investments. Uh, I spoke to the founders of Nintex who were based in Australia in 2010, and I found them at a trade show effectively for Microsoft users. And I was just amazed at how many people were around their booth, which you don't have to be too smart to figure out, hey, there must be something good going on there. So I stayed in touch with those guys. And I represented myself as an investor and one that would really like to learn more and possibly get involved. And we maintained a relationship up until 2013, where they finally decided that they really could use some investment and Updata, my firm, and uh, a private equity firm whom I brought into it, actually invested uh, in a significant way in Australia when it was still based in Melbourne. Uh, we with the founders said that what we'd like to do is build a worldwide global company based on their success. We had some really good ideas about how to scale. So we moved headquarters to Seattle from Melbourne. We left everybody in Melbourne that was there and continued to grow it. Uh, and we hired a global publicly experienced uh, set of people. I stepped in as CEO, stepped out of my job as a in investor 
And in the ensuing five years, we grew into customers in 90 countries, wow. offices in 40 countries, selling globally with partners, 2,000 of them actually across the globe, which when you have that many force amplifiers in your sales and go to market, you can grow pretty fast. You have to have a good product, of course. And I think we really did. We really pioneered what now is known as low code, no code or uh, workflow automation. Give us a little bit of an example of how their workflow automation works, just so we, the listeners can get a better understanding. Well, first of all, statistically speaking, about 80% of the business applications that people use have been around for quite some time. The problem is those are all very transactional. If you take the kinds of work that uh, office workers do, it's very collaborative. It is very dependent and asynchronous. It's not transactionally based at all. So let's say you want to file an expense report, then you want to get it approved, or you want to hire somebody and you have multiple people that want to interview that candidate. How do you sequence and automate the process of what are everybody's comments? What is what is your particular firm do and how does it do it? So workflow automation is basically a platform and graphically represented. There's no code involved. Wow. And you basically draw a flow chart which is very, very simple to be done with some logic behind it, which again is not computer code. And you use what people normally use, which is unstructured data. So think forms, paper, graphics, uh, designs. And I would send you uh, a note to say, hey, Wayne, it's your time to interview somebody. Give me your comments and I can sequence it uh, to anybody that needs to be doing that. So 80% of the things that people use at an IT level were automated. 80% of the people that are like us and people probably listening to this, 80% is not automated. So there's a huge tail of things that would be much more efficient if you can develop a platform or a system to be able to automate. And that's what workflow automation and that platform really is. That is so cool. And the ability to use unstructured data and put it together into a workflow that makes sense and is usable is really valuable. To me, well, think about every, everything lawyers do. That's, uh, <laughs> that's around paper. Unstructured. Uh, and, and exactly. Nonsensical. Everything that an HR department does, it's the <laughs> same way. Everybody has a lot of things that they'd love to have much more efficient and automated. So today you're serving on at least two boards that I can see. Are there, uh, uh, Jagger is one of them. Tell us a little bit about that company, if you can tell us. It's another SaaS uh, company. Uh, Jagger is a company that's based in North Carolina, but does business all over the world. It's about uh, 300 million or so with 2,000 very uh, sophisticated customers who manage the whole spend, procure to spend type of process, uh, procurement, supply chain automation. And it's a fintech application, if you will. The company has a long history. It's been uh, a couple of companies that kept on acquiring, growing and building. And they've gotten to the point where they really need to propel themselves further. It's owned by a private equity firm called Sinvin in the UK. And what I really enjoy doing is working with the management team, uh, mentor them along, help them avoid the mistakes that I made, uh, which there were plenty. Um, and also talking about situations I've been in, what it's like to run a public company. What do you do to groom the company to get ready to go public and satisfy its investors for a long time and continue to build value? 70 countries is a lot of countries, 2,000 customers. Who are the customers? Uh, customers like the Siemens and Bosch in Germany, uh, American Express. In, but it also goes down to companies that are only perhaps uh, two, 3,000 people in total. So it's and very scalable. A company like this, is how old is it? The Jagger started in North Carolina with a name called SciQuest. And... SciQuest actually went public and a private equity firm called XLKKR brought it private. It then combined with two other sizable European countries. And then after Sinovid Invest, it changed its name to Jagger. I so it's got a long, long legacy um, and it's really trying to, if you will, propel itself as the leader and become much more well-known. I mean, it's such an area of need in terms of supply chain management. Uh, making things move through our systems across the world is uh, is a major issue today, as you know better than anyone. Um, well, one of the things we see in the technology industry, and you'll see in a lot of 
evolving SaaS companies is they are applying artificial intelligence to what they do. So in a supply chain, for example, if you're trying to procure something, it, if you're a procurement professional, you'll know two or three suppliers who you regularly use and you, you'll actually spend a lot of time with them negotiating, make sure that they supply you on time. But think about it today. You may have a great vendor who can't get the raw materials they, that you need to buy. So artificial intelligence can go in, identify out of a 5 million supplier database, who has what materials, what do you need, what are the costs, are they available, what is the shipping time, and what will be the backup after the first order. All done automatically. Wow. But those techniques are being applied to virtually everything that's a, that's a SaaS application. The uh, the amount of data and the amount of data management that goes into that must be extraordinary. Well, th without a doubt, and there's more research data available that companies use, and that data is located in multiple clouds, vendors, public clouds, your own legacy systems, your mainframes, your servers, your desktops. How do you put that all together is something that's being uh, looked at and virtually every bigger company than now has a data science department to do just that. Exactly. And C Data, that's another company that you're also serving as chairman of the board on. Tell us a little bit, little bit about that company. Uh, C Data is, uh, in many ways, the inverse of Jagger in that it's a relatively new company. It was built by a bunch of engineers. And what they were doing is building technology to do just what you said, share data, move it around, put it together, connect a system like Salesforce to NetSuite to your own legacy uh, general ledger system on your own data computer. They have two different, 250 different ways to connect systems to one another, all built and published by engineers. And they have about 4,000 downloads of those per month. What they don't have and which they really need is a lot more sophistication in how do you go that, bring that to market? How do you continue to grow at the rate that they have? The company today is about 200 people, very fast growth. And what we're trying to do is layer in the processes to have them perpetuate that growth and end up as the leader in the market. That's fascinating. So building processes is going to enable them to grow by an exponential factor as opposed to just how they've been growing so far is what I'm hearing you say. Uh, we. We hope so, because you have to take care of your customers and the customer base you're building up and have them stay with you over a long period of time. And that uh, treatment of them in a good way will yield much, many more, uh, many more customers as well. Of all the companies that you've worked with over the years, what would be your greatest success if you had to look back? <laughs> that, that, that's a good question. I, I started my own software company uh, with a partner back in Boston in the 80s. Um, and we ended up merging that in with a Virginia-based company named Legion, which was in those days well-known. And then I've stayed at Legion for quite some time. But what I would say is I look back at the things that I've been involved with, and I look at the teams that we built, people that I had an opportunity to work with, and what probably makes me most motivated and satisfied is I see how many of those people have gone on to run their own companies, start their own companies, be a very successful entrepreneur or executive in a large scale company. So it's, it's more the people that I've worked with and the sustaining those relationships. And these days I try to do more to help people along the way because obviously I've um, had great opportunities I'd like others to have. Today, if you're, you're advising a lot of young engineers, a lot of young executives, what would be the advice that you would give them to achieve success in what they're doing in the software and technology industry? I, I think if I look back, particularly the software business, and since that's really the only one I know, what I'd say though, is it applies to everything. And that is in the business you're trying to be successful, learn the economic and business model that makes it thrive. If you really understand how a business operates, you can really relate to other people in your company and what they do, how they can help you, how you can help them. And, and I think people tend to sometimes specialize too much. You have to be an expert in what you do, but if you can become at least very conversant and understand what other people do to make your whole company successful, 
that gives you an opportunity to really either rise in a company or maybe at some point in time, join a management team in another company or even start your own. Excellent advice. Um, it is the people. It's the people that we can mentor, the people that we can work with, the people that we get an opportunity to learn from. Um, it's all about the people. Uh, I can look back at my career and say that of all the things I've been involved with, the ones I know I enjoy the most are when I had people that were teammates trying to accomplish something, challenged each other, and we had no autocrats in that, in that environment at all. Everybody wanted to stay up and help their teammates to make the whole succeed. Well, teamwork makes the dream work. I mean, the, the, that's a cliche, but it's, it's for sure. Without a doubt. We've been talking with John Burton, our special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. John, thank you so much for being our special guest today. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, Wayne. And stay tuned for our educational moment. Again, I'm going to make it a surprise. You need to, to listen in to listen to the educational moment and get a little bit more about what we've been talking with John about. Thanks again, and we'll be back with our educational moment right after this. Hi, this is Wayne Zell, and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth's educational moment. We're going to be talking today about selling your business, and this is part one of a multi-part series that will help you get your business ready for sale. So let's get started. The overview is that we're trying to do some corporate house cleaning. We want to do some due diligence on ourselves before we unleash a prospective buyer on our books and records. So the first thing we're going to do is look at our minutes to authorize prior acts as well as future uh, acts that need to be approved by the board of directors or shareholders. We're going to make sure that we've filed with all the appropriate jurisdictions and states. We're going to examine our financial statements and we're going to dig into that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about legal compliance and due diligence in a little greater detail. When I say we need to update our minutes or our consents, if you're a corporation, you must have formal approvals by your board of directors and your shareholders of certain acts that need to be approved on an annual basis or from time to time. So when we mention that we need to ratify prior acts, that means we're approving things that we did in the past, and that would include electing our officers and directors. Approving leases that we entered into for long-term leases, capital or operating leases. Loans that we may have borrowed money or lent money to third parties. Approving of any benefit plans that we may have adopted for the benefit of our employees, including 401k plans, profit sharing plans, qualified retirement plans, and health benefit plans, medical plans, dental plans, all of those things need to be approved at least by the board of directors, depending on what your bylaws say. And lastly, we want to make sure that any stock that has been issued to shareholders, including the founders, has been approved and any stock options and the plans approving of the issuance of those options have been approved by the board of directors and shareholders uh, if required. When we're talking about approving new transactions, you're about ready to discuss the sale of your business. And so you may receive an indication of interest. You may receive a letter of intent. When you narrow down the letters of intent to one and you want to sign it and it's to the exclusion of all others, your board of directors should approve it and should send it for approval to the shareholders. When you have negotiated the definitive agreement, the purchase agreement, with the prospective buyer. We want the board and the shareholders to sign off on those documents as well. So we're going to have a consent of the directors and shareholders or a meeting where it's duly called in accordance with your bylaws and approved at the meeting. And so minutes need to be taken and included with your corporate records. And last but not least, I didn't include it on the slide, you need to have a stock book with all of the stock certificates at least copied front and back and signed and a stock ledger that indicates what stock certificates were issued to whom and when they were canceled and reissued. Part of the due diligence process, part of your corporate house cleaning is going to making 
to make sure that you have all of your organizational documents in order and that you filed with the state and local jurisdictions that you're required to file with. Your articles of incorporation or your certificate of incorporation were filed at the time the entity was formed. And if you amended them, you want to make sure you have copies of the actual filed versions, not what you sent to the state, but what you received back, including a certificate from the state indicating that you were filed as a corporation or a limited liability company, depending on how you're structured. Any amendments that were filed with the state, you want to make sure it's in your corporate books and records. If you're a corporation, you need to have bylaws, which is the contract between the shareholders, the directors, the officers, and the corporation on how the corporation is run. If you're a limited liability company, an LLC, you'll have an operating agreement. And if you're a corporation with two or more shareholders, you may need a shareholders agreement as well. The buyer is going to want to make sure that the business that they're buying is in good standing, meaning that they are properly formed, but also in compliance with current law by filing annual reports and paying any fees that you have to pay to the state, including franchise taxes, which are payable in states like Delaware and Virginia. If you were formed in Delaware and you're operating in another state like Maryland or Virginia or Florida, you need to make sure that you have registered as a foreign entity in the states in which you're operating. It's a little more complicated than just saying, well, I have an employee there. But if you have an employee there, an office there, you're selling from that location or you're keeping inventory at that location or you're, you've got uh, property located at that location, you're going to want to make sure that you are filing properly in all of those jurisdictions. It's not just sales tax or use tax or payroll tax or even income tax. You actually have to file as a foreign entity. And lastly, if you are an S corporation or treated as one, because remember an LLC can elect to be treated as an S corp, you want to make sure you have the official letter that was issued to you from the Internal Revenue Service when you were granted S corp status. The buyer always looks for that. With regard to your financial statements, most of our clients who sell their businesses are doing their accounting on the cash basis of accounting meaning that they file their tax returns on a cash basis and they don't accrue accounts receivable on their books and records or accounts payable or other accruals that you would normally reflect an economic revenue number or an economic expense number. They're only doing cash basis. The buyer is going to want you to make representations and warranties in your agreement that your books are prepared in accordance with GAAP generally accepted accounting principles, which requires accrual basis accounting. So you may need to restate your financial statements. It's not a big deal to do that, believe me, unless you've got significant amounts of inventory and then it becomes a little bit more complicated. But have your accountant come in and prepare gap-based financials to match and reconcile to the cash basis financials. These financial statements will account for liabilities of all kinds, including ones that may not be officially recognized on your balance sheet, but may be disclosed in footnotes to the financial statements. The footnotes, which are also in accordance with GAAP, reveal the method of accounting that you're using, how you're recognizing revenue and accruing expenses, how you're depreciating your assets, how you're maintaining your leases and accounting for them, and, and how you're accounting for your equity in the company, including stock options, phantom stock, and other deferred compensation arrangements. The last point on financial statements is whether or not you are going to show the buyer that you've had some diligence done by an outside third party on your financials. The difference is significant. If you just hand your financial statements over, your QuickBooks or whatever you're using over to your accountant at the end of the year and have them prepare financial statements, that's known as a compilation form of engagement, which is the least rigorous, the lowest cost, but also it doesn't give the buyer 
any assurance of the validity or accuracy of your financials. If you have a review done by your accounting firm, they may perform some analytical procedures to make sure that there's nothing truly unusual about the numbers that you're giving them to report in the financial statements. But if you do an audit, then you're getting an assurance from the auditors that your financial statements are prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles with no exceptions, hopefully, and that gives you an unqualified opinion and that's what buyers are really looking for if you can afford it and you have the time to do it. Last but not least is legal compliance and due diligence. This is where you get your attorneys involved. And if your attorney is a specialist like a government contracts lawyer, or you've only used your lawyer uh, for technology purposes to register trademarks or patents, you are going to need other lawyers involved to help you do your due diligence and do your corporate cleanup to get you ready so that the buyer comes in and looks at everything and says, wow, these people really have it together. The first thing they're going to do is make sure that your equity ownership is properly reflected in your books and records. And that means stock certificates are issued, they're recorded, and that you have subscription agreements for the stock. It also will include approvals of stock option plans and any issuances of stock or stock options under the plan. It will have a clear understanding. The lawyers will have a clear understanding and, and you will have records relating to all of your borrowing that's currently outstanding, including COVID-19 type relief that was provided by the federal government, such as payroll protection plan loans. You're going to want to make sure that somebody, either internally or externally, catalogs all of your active contracts. And then make sure that if you do have contracts with customers or vendors, are they assignable in a sale of the business? Even if you sell your stock, can you do so without requiring the consent of your contracting party? Taxes are another very difficult and complicated area of legal compliance and due diligence. You're going to want to make sure you've paid and filed all your sales tax, payroll tax, income tax, and any other tax that is owed by the company to the taxing authorities. You're going to want to have good records of all of the returns that you've filed with the IRS or the state or wherever you reside. You're going to want to make sure you have copies of all the returns and you're going to want to have evidence of the actual filing. If you have that in your files, it'll make life a lot easier for you and the buyer when they come around. Your employees are another critical area. Do you have I-9s for every employee? In other words, did you check their immigration status or their citizenship status when they were employed? If not, You'd better get it in the records now for every single employee. Do you have non-competes, non-disclosure agreements, and non-interference agreements with your employees? You, at a minimum, are going to need non-disclosure agreements. And then have you accounted for and reported properly for all of the employee benefits that you're providing to your employees? Are you treating independent contractors properly? Are they truly independent contractors? Have you handled the situation where a, an employee is listed as being exempt from overtime? And have you actually verified their status to make sure that they truly are exempt versus non-exempt where they would be required to be paid overtime? Do you have any litigation pending against you or any threats of litigation or claims? Any governmental investigations? Any IRS audits? You need to disclose all of that to the buyer, so you might as well get all that inf information together. When it comes to intellectual property, privacy laws now, and data protection, the buyer is going to want to make sure you have valid licenses to everything that you're using in your business that would constitute intellectual property, such as software, software licenses, trademarks, patents, 
copyrights, trade secrets, and know-how. If you own real estate in your company, you're going to need to have detailed information regarding the real estate, whether or not it's subject to current zoning regulation, and whether or not there are any environmental violations. And if you're leasing the real estate, you still are going to have to give reps and warranties regarding environmental issues, particularly depending on the type of business that you operate. And lastly, but not least, you want to make sure that you've got your customers and your vendors documented well. You want to know who your pipeline of prospective customers and contracts are. And you want to make sure that you've got a complete list of all of these people available to you so that at the appropriate time, after you've got a signed letter of intent and after you've negotiated the critical terms in your purchase agreement, you can turn over this very secret information to a prospective buyer, or you may want to wait until after you've signed the definitive agreement and give them a chance to do due diligence on your customers particularly. So that's what I've got for you in part one of selling your business. You're listening and watching Blueprint for Wealth, and thanks for tuning in. Tune in next time for another special topic and special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. I'm Wayne Zell. Have a great week.